that was the week. We're on Friday, March the 5th, and it was quite a week in the history of a certain Keith Tier. He became, what, the 50 millionth person in the world, Keith, to get COVID? Is that right? I got, I got COVID a month or more ago, but I got the vaccine this week. But it seems like the vaccine affected you more than the COVID itself. Holy shit, did it? It was, it, I have... Was it like 103 temperature or something? Yeah, but that was the least of the problem. The temperature I could kind of deal with, I, I had to stay in bed for two days. But um, in the middle of the night, the first night afterwards, I, I got dizzy. I fainted, like just this far away from fainting. Uh, I had to stagger back from the bathroom to my bedroom and I fell on the bed, luckily. So I didn't hit myself. But it, it was a dramatically big impact probably because I'd already had COVID, my body treated this like the second uh, vaccine, which meant it had a major response. And obviously that was my body doing what it's meant to do, which is yeah. fighting the invader. But it was, it, it was um, I was not prepared for how dramatic it was, to be honest. Now I'm through it, I'm so glad I had the vaccine because um, you know whatever the experience was, I'm now better than I was before. So uh, don't let it put you off, but be prepared for two days in bed if you get it. Be prepared then for the real COVID or the fake COVID or the fake vaccine. Um, and the subject of today's show is about reality and fakery. Uh, the title of your newsletter is WTF. No one needs me to translate that. Are NFTs. What are NFTs, Keith? And why perhaps did your body need an NFT when it came to COVID to uh, avoid the awful week you had on the health front? Good attempt to link the content there, Andrew, but flawed, I believe. <laughs> Explain um, why. You know, the uh, NFT stands for non-fungible token. And I will confess that two weeks ago, I didn't know what it stood for. Uh, but a few things have happened that dominate this week's newsletter. The first is that Square's Jack Dorsey bought the majority shareholding in Tidal, Jay-Z's music company, which puzzled everyone. And then um, it was announced that $230 million has been spent by fans on National Basketball Association video collections that are unique um, to the buyer. And uh, suddenly the, this thing about non-fungible tokens is a question that anyone who's paying attention to tech is going to have to ask themselves. So what are they? Um, it's very simple. Um, in the real world, art is unique. And there are people who will validate that a painting is actually the unique painting. Or let's say, or people are unique. There is only one Keith Tier. People are unique. Um, there's lots of things that are unique. You know, um, um, what an NFT does is it makes it possible for a digital artifact to be determined to be unique. So it's stamped with its authenticity, essentially. It's stamped with its authenticity, which can also be its provenance. Uh, and its ownership. It's currently it's a ownership. huge deal. This then, who invented this technology? It's it's part of um, uh, the crypto network known as Ethereum. Has a number of different token types, and non non fungible tokens is a type of, of token on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and it was invented by um, the same people that invented Ethereum, uh, which is. Um, uh, I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try, but he's a, a very, very clever young... Yeah, we'll have to get... I'll have to call my friend Elizabeth Stark. Elizabeth, if you're watching, she's one of the uh, the pioneers of this stuff. It's so basically, uh, is this, is, does it's NFTs, do they fix the whole problem of piracy? I mean, once you have NFTs... No, no, they don't. No, they don't. Think of, think of piracy as needing a technology that prevents there being fake copies. Where, whereas what NFTs do is authenticate that this is the original single version. So, so 
the Do first it. mover, the thing in itself, the, the first, thing in itself. The, the platonic, uh, the, the platonic version of anything digital. This is yeah. So if you buy a piece of digital art, as has happened this week, for millions of dollars, um, um, and you you want to display it in the future, you can probably display it as virtual reality or augmented reality as well. So it doesn't have to be on a screen. Um, you can prove that you're the owner, and it is the one. So it's interesting that it opens up a distinction between value and what it looks like. Because the, the, the digital version of a piece of art could be replicated and would be identical. But yeah. if you want to maintain the value, you have to prove that you're the one who owns it. So yeah. even if it looks identical, it's not valued in the same way. The same as if I took a really high resolution photograph of the Mona Lisa using the latest Sony A1 camera um, and framed it, and it would look, you know, from a distance exactly like the original. Um, it, it isn't the original. And so what does this do to the whole question of uh, sort of invented reality? Um, and then the, you, 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 you forwarded me that uh, link with Tom Cruise. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that let, uh, we can show it actually. Um, um, just give me a second, and I will, I will, um, um, I will try to find where I texted that to you, and I will open it up in a browser. Where is it? Here we go. <clears throat> And, um, let, let me just share. Let me just share that window. Uh, sorry to mess us around here on a live show, but in order to do it, I've got to share a different tab than the one uh, than the one I was sharing. Um, interesting, interesting. But well, anyway. No, I, 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 I can do it. I can do it, but it's going to take me just a second. Just give me a second. Here we go. Now I, now I can do it. Um, share my screen. Um, here we go. So, is, here is not Tom Cruise. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? I love it. Of course, for the audio experience. as much as the momentum. Hey, listen up, sports and TikTok fans. If you like what you're seeing, just wait till what's coming next. So um, there you, there you right. have... Um, there so you have... NFT, so, so can, would Cruz then use NFT to stamp all his own videos online and could eliminate deep fakes from his brand? He could. It would be quite an effort to apply an NFT to every single video he does today because the technology is... Well, not... once it gets scaled, surely that's the, the next step. And does that explain why uh, Jack is interested in Jay-Z's title? Because a lot of people are scratching their heads over the fit. Well, so artists clearly are a big audience for getting paid. And Square is a payment system. Yeah. So um, Jack is a big fan of crypto. And um, my guess is that uh, within this acquisition is a desire to build a payment system for artists. And I think that payment system will cover two use cases. The first is um, just getting paid for your regular stuff. But the second, and that includes your live stuff, almost anything you do. But the second is um, unique products. 
So for example, let's say Bruce Springsteen did a private concert and wanted to sell it to a single bidder. He could do that. Yeah. Um, or let's say he wanted to create a hundred seats, digital seats at the front of a viewing experience. He could do that. Right. And, uh, uh, and, and I don't know if you're listening to Springsteen's uh, podcast with uh, Obama, but Springsteen essentially did that for Obama when he did his live show at the White House when uh, at the end of the Obama second term. So this, again, replicates real life in the sense that Bruce Springsteen himself showed up, not some someone pretending to be Bruce Springsteen. So, again, this seems to be the merging of what we used to call real life and online life. Yeah, it's it, it's digital identity, but for assets, not for people. But it, but it can be applied to any asset a person produces. And then, obviously, it's, it's somehow embedded in the blockchain so yeah. that you can't lose the records. You can't lose the records, and you can trade them. So just like trading cards, if they go yeah. up in value, you can choose to trade. Um, new is this the new economy, Keith? That the uh, sort of on the horizon, the, when we look through the mist, when we peer through this Bitcoin, Ethereum mist, is this somehow the outlines of the new economy? I, you know, I've been struggling with this idea since 2005. I, at my company, Edgio, that I co-founded with Michael Arrington, we, I think two years in, we created this uh, digital wrapper, which could contain white papers or music or any digital artifact. And we tied it into a, a shopping cart and we made it possible to buy a digital artifact wrapped inside this wrapper. But we then crypto wasn't around and um, we weren't focused on uniqueness, so we were just focused on... Oh, you're always too early, Keith. You need to slow down. 15 years too early. Uh, there's another really interesting piece on this that you have in your newsletter on digital currency by the very, very talented uh, Columbia University economist, Adam Tooze. What does Adam Tooze say about this new economy? Um, Adam is talking about the... Um, the inevitability of money transforming from what we know it as today, dollars and pounds, into a wide range of other elements, let's call them. Uh, he quotes Gramsci um, very eloquently uh, saying that... Uh, Not everyone will know who Gramsci is, Keith. You with your, your communist background can explain <laughs> Antonio Gramsci. Yeah, Antonio Gramsci was an apologetic Stalinist. Um, well, that's what, that's the unkind version. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, but he was an Italian, an Italian Marxist theorist of culture and of of power. Yeah, he was an Italian intellectual. Today, he'd be thought of as a libertarian social democrat, um, and and but he was very clever, very smart, and he talked about the theory of money and how money is part of civil society, that it's not part of economic infrastructure, that money really uh, has its authority through people accepting it, um, not, not because governments print it. So, so, what is, so what does Adam say in terms of this Gramscian analysis of crypto? Uh, he says that um, Bitcoin as a currency is a libertarian dream today. Um, but he believes it's, a it's more than a dream. It's becoming a reality, right? But it's becoming a reality, and so we're now in the transition from money printed by governments to whatever comes next. And Bitcoin's part of that puzzle. Interestingly enough, I had a Twitter back and forth with Michael McFall, the former, um, the former um, uh, ambassador to Russia. Who yeah, I yeah, Stanford-based guy. I know him. And he was writing about America and China and what relationship they need to have. And I went in and said, well, a currency and global reserves is going to have to be a big part of that, which Michael, of course, being who he is, was very much on the political layer. Mm -hmm. And I tried to make the point that the economic layer is actually going to drive everything. And globalization is economic before it's political. It may never be political because it might get stopped. But economically, it's unstoppable. 
there's also the nationalization of this. I mean, India and other countries now are trying to nationalize um, crypto to sort of create digital na national digital currencies. Yeah. How does that impact on uh, Adam Tooze's argument? Well, that is, I think that is mainly about interoperability in the future. If, if you don't have a digital currency in the future, your currency won't easily be interoperable with all the systems that the world needs to run. And, and so the inefficiencies of paper, never mind gold, go away. And you end up with, uh, weirdly enough, what Lenin talked about, which is accounting is simply an electronic ledger. And it really seems as if crypto is, <clears throat> even for skeptics like myself, it's for real. And the fact that Dorsey at Square, which is one of the, the pioneering crypto companies, is now acquiring essentially music content platforms, proves that we're beyond the experimental stage. It's becoming uh, the actual economy as the internet was the actual economy in the mid 90s. Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the, the slightly comical version of it is that Mark Cuban announced today that the Dallas Mavericks will be accepting Dogecoin as payment for tickets and merchandise, um, which Dogecoin is, is the joke crypto coin that was created satirically and has now become quite valuable. Right. Although quite, you, people used to joke about Cuban in the mid 90s. And as always with Cuban, he seems to have the last laugh. So I'd never write that guy off. I just uh, got a beta invite to Fireside, which is his app. Yeah, I'd like that. So then maybe we can experiment. Can you pass that on? So let's move on. So we're talking about, we, we have been talking about the emerging economy, the real internet economy, which was essentially founded by Google in 1999, 2000, is the online Web 2.0 advertising economy. And there's big news on that front this week, too. That's changing, just as everything is changing. What's happening on the advertising economy front, Keith? Well, Google's announced that it's abandoning third-party cookies. And third-party cookies are the things that track you around the internet mm. and, and uh, enable um, platforms or advertisers to build a profile, a very specific profile about you. Google's abandoning it largely because it has to, because uh, mainly because of Apple's decision. Right. So this is not good. Some, some, some of our privacy libertarian crowd will be saying, oh, that's great news. But it actually isn't good news for, for, for privacy advocates, is it? I think it's nuanced. So I, um, I write... I think there's a lot of nuance when it comes to Google. Maybe Apple there is. But what's nuanced about Google? Google wants to own... I mean, again, what Google is trying to do, as it's always tried to do, is transform the internet into Google. Isn't that fair? Well, let's 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 do an explainer first. Okay. So um, we're jumping ahead. Yeah. What 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 they're doing is um, they're replacing third-party cookies with a system called Flock, F L O C. And what Flock is is that if you're an Android user or a Chrome user, uh, th they know everything you do. And they're going to start to uh, characterize you and put you into one of a, of a fixed set of buckets. So they won't know that you're Andrew Keen, but they'll say, right. you belong in this bucket. They'll then allow that bucket to be read by advertisers in order to target you appropriately. So the nuance comes in here. Unless we can get rid of advertising altogether, which I would prefer. Yeah, but that's not going to happen then I actually want to be understood, but I don't want to be tracked. So um, being understood is difficult. Um, I'm not going to simplify this or suggest that it's doable, but with modern machine learning and deep learning, it's closer to being doable than ever before. That, that understanding a person involves knowing their short-term tastes and they're kind of consistent. Yeah, but Lakeith, this, you're giving Google a very, very generous read on this. I mean, what Google seems to me to be doing is... I'm not okay, saying... I'm not saying yeah, what, what Google has always been, as Eric Schmidt so famously said, I think it was in 2010 to the FT, we want to know you, we at Google, when he was the CEO of Google back then, we want to know you better than you know yourself. 
because that is the holy grail in economic terms. Because if they know us better than we know ourselves, they know what we want to buy, where we want to go, what we're thinking, they can sell us anything we want. Yeah. And what it seems as if in this post-cookie internet, which looks inevitable, what Google want to do is replace the cookie, which is a, a kind of third-party open system, to one in which all the the personal data about us is controlled either through Android or through Chrome, which is theirs. So they're not going to share it with anyone. Is that fair? Well, it's, it, it is, but it also shows their weakness because we, we the people, now have a... We should all be so weak, Keith, that we, no, but we, own, me, we own Android and the Chrome browser. Let me make my point, though. Why, are, why is it showing weakness? Because we can choose not to use Android and Chrome easily. Right. But most people don't know that, do they? Does this does this does this indicate a new? We had the browser wars of the '90s again, going back to the '90s, Netscape versus the Microsoft, blah blah. Is there going to be a new browser war now between, particularly Safari and Chrome, with uh, Firefox kind of caught in between? And Microsoft Edge is actually making a play as well. Um, so what's Microsoft's role? Are they more on the Apple side? I would guess they are playing that game, but. You know, you can't really trust that, can you? Um, it's I great, think it's great digital power politics now. It's these, yeah. it's it's like the British and the Russians and the French and the Germans in the 19th century, and it's Google, Microsoft, Apple. Now, if you move forward, um, there are some problems. Like we're using Restream here to do our show, and Restream only works in Google, uh, Chrome, or a yeah. Chrome-based browser. There are other Chrome-based browsers like Brave. Or Edge are both Chrome based, so uh, there, are, you know, there are we can make choices if we're intelligent. That said, I think there's a more interesting conversation, which is if if advertising isn't going away, and and um, you don't want to be invaded or even worse, badly served. I mean, the, those ads that show up after you've just bought a pair of shoes, showing you the same yeah. pair of shoes, you know. So what, so what I argue for in, in the editorial is a whitelist of opted in advertisers that we, the individuals, can choose. Um, like I would choose Sony cameras. I would choose Blackmagic um, Design, who do, who do lots of stuff I'm interested in. I would choose, you know, the Premier League. Um, so I, there are certain things I wouldn't mind. Uh, various newsletters but, that I'd for most people, I mean, it's for you the ultimate geek. You can do this. Most people don't have the interest or the time or the knowledge to feed into their browser what ads they want to see. I mean, isn't this really creepy in the sense that Google now this is this is its this is its opportunity. This is its effort to conquer the entire internet. It, I think it's the the end for Google. Go Google um, Go Google's footprint will shrink from here on because of this. It's fascinating. I, I, you know, you could argue it either way. I agree. It's not clear. I think, it'll, I think it'll shrink. I think it'll open up lots of interesting innovation. Uh, and I think the, the end result will be consumer, you know, Doc Searles in his famous uh, The Clue Train Manifesto at the start of the internet said markets are conversations. And what he meant by that is, the consumer is increasingly going to have all the power the more the yeah. internet uh, we've penetrates. We've heard that before, but uh, yeah, and that's never been proved to be. Uh, that gets annoying when you keep on bringing, when not you, but when you keep on hearing this stuff about, oh, the consumer's in power when they have le less and less power. I'm just curious on the Google front, do you think this is a move from weakness or strength on their part? Are weakness. they getting nervous or do they see the, the next step as controlling everything? It's a survival play. It is not a growth play. Against what? Who is their biggest enemy? Apple? Apple. And in Apple's interest, we get rid of advertising and just we just use Apple devices and they laugh all the way to the bank? Well, because, because Apple has a big footprint, if they say no cookies and Google wants you know, to show ads on Apple devices, it has to play their game. And everyone's kind of concerned. I mean, I'm an example of someone who should know better. I'm strongly in the Apple camp, and yet I use Chrome, and I never use Safari. So I guess browsers are back in the news. We'll return to those. Um, 
Startup of the week, Keith. What's going on with the startup? Who's the big startup this week? The, the startup of the week is the English company Hopin, who managed to raise $400 million. British led by... or English? You know you're not supposed to say English these days. It's politically incorrect. Yeah. They are actually English. Good. Uh, at least the, the company's based in I England. I hope they're not from Manchester. They, they were originated in Manchester, but they're centered in London these days. Uh, they were originally seed funded by Seed Camp. I should disclose that my UK fund is a is an investor in Seed Camp and therefore indirectly an investor in Hopin. Um, and they're valued today at five point four billion dollars, which doesn't seem amazing in the context of what's going on in the world, except for the fact they've only been um, they've only been funded for the last less than two years. So. This is a, the, the largest growth story in history, and it's, and it's driven by actual growth in their business. But aren't they very vulnerable to the return to the physical economy? Aren't, isn't everything, all these online plays, <clears throat> once, once everyone gets the vaccine and suffers the 102 temperature you went through, hop in will <clears throat> go back to normal. Hop in will hop back to being just another startup. I think there's going to be a lot of truth in that, but I think there's some residual elements. Like, uh, to be honest, technically speaking, Hopin is last generation. Um, yeah. They just acquired StreamYard, which is like Restream that we're using. They're using a, a, a technology known as RTMP, which is a streaming technology. And then they're not able to do what Clubhouse can do, which is have a seamless upgrade from being in the audience to being a participant because streaming doesn't give you that opportunity. Um, with StreamYard, they've bought what we're doing. And with Hopin, they've got the streaming piece, but they can't kind of create the elevator between the two. Maybe they should buy Restream. Restream couldn't give them that either. They, they, they would have to buy a, a more modern technology based on WebRTC for streaming. Um, and 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 be prepared to start early early in its life cycle and grow it and build it and become a technology company well they're They've, certainly they're certainly um an interesting company finally keith is he back paul graham your hero is he the tweet of the week this week he is the tweet of the week um paul graham and i'm not going to show it because i'm on my laptop and it's too hard for me to do everything that I normally do. When I press on the link, it doesn't go anywhere. I don't know. Did he delete another tweet, Paul? Is he self-censoring again? You know, I could look at, I can look on my uh, desktop and tell you the answer to that. I don't know if he is, but the let's tell everyone what it was. Do you, I was, hope you saved it. We can flash it up on the screen. I, I, I definitely did. He, he basically uh, doesn't want a wealth tax. He makes the case surprise, that, surprise. Yeah, he makes the case that if there was a wealth tax, and, and let, again, let's do a bit of an explainer. The way a wealth tax works, and um, my my uh, recently passed away friend Jean Marie Hulot, who was the chief technology technology officer at Next, told me about how it works in France, and this is typically how it works: the government takes a certain percent of your total net worth every year. So um, it doesn't matter if it's liquid. They look at your house, your mm. stock, everything, and they take a certain amount every year. Now, um, if, if, if your net worth doesn't grow, eventually they take it all. Um, if it was 5%, you know, it takes 20 years to take it all. If it grows That's by... Uh, because well, you're, only being, you're only being taxed 5% of what you have. So if you, ha if you start with 100 mil... Yeah, you're, and you're right. Five percent, yeah. and at some point you fall below the the threshold. You're right. My 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 math was flawed. You're quite right. But but Paul Graham's point is that eventually, and he does the math, uh, the government can take up to ninety percent of everything you own over your lifetime. Which <coughs> and, isn't and, a bad number if you're worth several hundred million dollars or billions of dollars. I think Paul thought it was self evident that was a bad thing. <laughs> well, what's the tweet? Because it, as always with Paul Graham, it pissed off a lot of people. Um, the tweet, the tweet um, would involve me getting it. So give me a second. 
sorry I'm not prepared to show you this, it's because I quickly had to change to my laptop just before uh, we started the show. The tweet is, and I will read it out right at the end here. The tweet is, waiting for it, if you start a successful startup in your 20s, a 2% wealth tax with a 50 million threshold means that over the course of your life, the government will take 65% of your stock. Why so much? Question. Because a wealth tax compounds. And um, he then says that the most popular proposal for a wealth tax in California is well above 2%. Mm. In fact, they'll take closer to 99%. But he forgets the fact that the 50 million also compounds. So it's compounding against compounding. And I'm sure that smart guys like Paul will invest their 50 million in things that re return more than 2%. Just like my math mistake, he also made a math mistake, uh, which he acknowledged in a later tweet. But that's probably why we're not seeing it. He's probably self-censored. His math mistake was to assume that the wealth doesn't grow faster than the wealth tax. And so finally, Keith, if we had NFTs, non-fungible tokens, um, would, would we still be able to see Paul Graham's tweet? Only if he owned it, assigned a token to it, and made it available in limited quantities to people who bought it. WTF. That is the perfect conclusion to this show. Interesting stuff, though. I think it's maybe not quite as sexy as some of the other stuff we've been dealing with. But I, I really think particularly the, the Google news is fascinating and important. And we're going to be talking about it a lot in future. The new browser wars, uh, the new economy, it's all happening on That Was The Week. We'll see you all next week for another sensational episode. And we're thrilled that Keith is still alive. Keith, keep going another week. So we'll see you next week. Will do. Thank you, Andrew.